Chapter Eighteen of Pixie O'Shaughnessy by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christmas preparations. Esmeralda strolled into the house in time for afternoon tea and smiled complacently around as she warmed herself at the fire. Blue cloth, she announced triumphantly no more serge thank you but good solid cloth with a fine surface to it and a smart little coat instead of a bodice which was pure unselfishness on my part for i should have been fitted well enough and the man pressed it on me but i thought of you me darling and the agony it would be to you to have your waist misjudged by a couple of inches so i stuck to the coat and i hope you are grateful i am said bridgie frankly but there was a pained expression mingling with her satisfaction and presently she added slowly so dennis was right and you got your way again i have been trying for ages to persuade father that we needed a new habit but he paid no attention to me you didn't go about it the right way me dear you are fifty times cleverer than i but there is one thing you don't understand and that is how to manage men they hate and detest being told what to do and the secret of getting round them is to make believe that what you want is their own suggestion you have to be very cunning and that's just what you can never manage to be yes she can came a shrill cry from the doorway as pixie burst into the room and made a bee-line for the tea-table indeed she can now esmeralda so it's no use denying it she can perfectly well the three listeners looked at each other with questioning glances for such vehemence was somewhat bewildering on the part of one who could not possibly have heard the first part of the conversation what can she do queried esmeralda sternly whatever you say she can't replied the champion unabashed and at that the cloud rolled off bridgie's brow like mist before the sun oh you precious goose bridgie can do everything can't she she always could in your eyes it's very silly of you dear but it's very nice i'm not at all vexed with you about it you would be though if you were her true friend but you always spoil one another you two cried esmeralda lightly then she stared round the room with a surprised expression and added disapprovingly you seem to have been fairly lazy while i've been out i thought you would have been getting on with the decorations whatever have you been doing roaming about and actually daring to enjoy ourselves like other people retorted bridgie with what mademoiselle was glad to recognize as a decided nip of severity but from this minute there must be no more playing until the work is finished dennis has cut the evergreens and we must begin making wreaths at once so as to be in order when jack arrives to-morrow evening we could have two hours work before dinner i loathe making wreaths they are so dirty and prickly and i take a pride in me hands they are the only ones i have and what's the use of sleeping in white kid gloves the same as if i were dressed for a party if they are to be scratched all over with that hateful holly esmeralda stretched out two well-shaped if somewhat large hands and gazed at them with pensive admiration but bridgie was firm and scratches or no scratches insisted that she should take her own share of the work as soon as tea was over then the family descended to the servants hall a whitewashed apartment about as cheerful as a vault and but little warmer despite the big peat fire where they set to work to reduce a stack of evergreens into wreaths and borderings for cotton wool merry christmases and happy new years reserved from former occasions pat and miles cut the branches into smaller and more workable proportions pixie unravelled string and wire and the three elders worked steadily at their separate wreaths at the end of an hour they had progressed so well that it was suggested that the three fragments should be tied together and the wreath hung in the hall to clear the room for further operations the suggestion being universally approved a stormy half-hour followed when each of the five o'shaughnessys 
harangued the others concerning the superiority of his or her own plan of decoration and precious lives were imperilled on the oldest and shakiest of step-ladders the boys could naturally mount to the highest step without a fear but when mounted were so clumsy and inartistic in their arrangements that they were called down with derisive cries and retired to sulk in a corner then bridgie lifted her skirt and gallantly ascended five steps felt the board sway beneath her and scuttled down to make way for her sister the daring rider across country possessed stronger nerves but also a heavier body and the latter creaked so ominously beneath her that she insisted upon the whole company acting as props in one breath sending them running for hammer and rope and in the next shrieking to them to return to their posts by the time that the wreath was really hung the friction had reached such a pitch that mademoiselle expected a state of civil war for the rest of the evening and even wondered if the atmosphere would have time to clear before christmas itself she could hardly believe the evidence of her senses when the boys affably volunteered to clear away the rubbish and bridgie and esmeralda went upstairs with wreathed arms calling one another darling and love with the echo of sharp taunt and sharper reply still ringing in the air certainly if the irish tongue were quick the heart seemed even quicker to forgive an enemy or pardon an offence by the time that mademoiselle had retired to bed that night the last remnant of strangeness had vanished and she felt like a lifelong friend and confidant she had seen the menu for the christmas dinner and had helped to manufacture jellies and creams while pixie perched upon the dresser industriously scraping basins of their sweet lemony creamy leavings with the aid of a teaspoon and an occasional surreptitious finger when her sisters were looking in the opposite direction she suggested and achieved such marvels in the way of garnishing that molly was greatly impressed being a very plain cook in more ways than one and solemnly asked for advice upon the killing of turkeys when mademoiselle had to acknowledge ignorance and lost caste forthwith then esmeralda invited her to a display of evening dresses in her bedroom and wished to know which she should wear the black silk with the net top or the net top over a white skirt or the black silk with no top at all and bridgie plaintively appealed to her for the casting vote on the great question of crackers or no crackers it was certainly a curious mingling of grandeur and poverty this life in the half-ruined castle with its magnificent tapestries and carvings its evidences of bygone splendour and alas present-day parsimony the little house at passy could have been put down inside the great entrance hall but it was a trim little habitation where on a minute scale all the refinements and niceties of life were observed and income and expenditure were so well balanced that there was always a margin to the good but the misses o'shaughnessy who bore themselves as queens in the neighbourhood and were treated with truly loyal deference owned hardly a decent gown between them and were seriously exercised about spending an extra half-crown on a christmas dinner it's the trifles that mount up i'm a miser about pennies but i can spend pounds with the best bridgie explained and mademoiselle smiled meaningly for had not the order just gone forth that the castle was to be illumined once more for the arrival of the sun and air on christmas eve the rain fell in torrents and after a morning spent in preparations of one sort and another the workers felt the need of a little amusing recreation this did not seem easy to achieve in this lonely habitation set in the midst of a rain-swept plain but bridgie's fertile brain came to the rescue and proposed a scheme which kept the young people busy for the rest of the afternoon i vote we have a fancy dress dinner to-night she cried at the conclusion of lunch not an ordinary affair but like the one the pegrams enjoyed so much when they were spending the winter in grindelwald 
a sheet and pillow-case party they called it for that is all you have out of which to make your dress i will open the linen box and give you each a pair of sheets and a pillow-case for headgear and you must arrange them in your own rooms and not let anyone see you until the gong rings it really will be quite pretty all the white figures against the flags and holly and we shall feel more festive than in our ordinary clothes i think it will be great fun don't you great fun indeed the o'shaughnessy family was always ready for any excitement and particularly so at christmas time a season when we all feel that we ought to be festive and are injured in our minds if there is nothing to make us so esmeralda fell at once to pleating her table napkin into one shape after another mademoiselle smiled over a happy inspiration whereupon wily pat put on his most angelic look and asked will you dress me mademoiselle a man's no good at this sort of thing you can't fasten sheets with screws and i'm no hand at fancy stitching i've an idea i'd look rather well as he whispered a few words into her ear and mademoiselle threw up her hands and laughed and nodded an emphatic assent pixie and miles fell to bridgie's share while the major declared that he would have nothing to do with such foolishness but with the ruminating expression on his face which belied the words bridgie went upstairs immediately after lunch and opening her linen chest apportioned its contents among the different members of the family some wanted large sheets some wanted small some begged for frills to their pillow-cases some preferred plain but at last all were satisfied and were further supplied with tape from the various work-baskets while pixie was sent a round of the bedrooms to pick up the pins with which the floors were liberally scattered as the demand in this direction was so large as to be practically unlimited esmeralda flew off at once with the boys in her train but mademoiselle lingered to help bridgie to fold away the linen that was not needed and to enjoy the luxury of a quiet chat which was not an easy thing to accomplish in this noisy household bridgie in company was always laughing and gay but the visitor had already noticed that bridgie alone was apt to grow grave and to wear a wistful pucker on her brow it was there now as she locked the chest and sat down on the lid stretching out her arms with a sigh of weariness the wintry light left the gallery full of shadows and the only bright thing to be seen was the girl's own golden head outlined against the oak walls mademoiselle thought that if she had been an artist she could have wished for no fairer picture than this old world corridor with the fair face of the young mistress shining out like a lily in the darkness but the lily toiled more than she liked to see and she could not restrain a protest against the custom which gave one sister all the work and another all the play you are tired already before the day is half over and now you have those children's dresses to look after as well as your own why do you not make esmeralda help instead of doing every thing yourself esmeralda is it bridgie's face lit up with a smile as she repeated the name indeed now mademoiselle i never worked so hard in my life as when esmeralda has been trying to help and i have to tidy away after her she has the best will in the world poor thing but work doesn't come naturally to her you mustn't be hard on her she shows her worst side to a stranger for though her first impulse may be selfish when she takes time to think she is all generosity and kindness that habit now she was longing to have a fitted bodice but she chose a coat out of consideration for me she's a darling and so young yet that i don't like to worry her let her have a good time as long as she may it will be hard enough soon mademoiselle started and looked alarmed questionings and bridgie smiled in response saying in cool conversational tones we're ruined you know we can't go on living here much longer father has spent all his money and we should have had to leave before now but that he came into a little more at mother's death 
it was not much and it is going very fast it can't be more than a year or two at most before the crash comes so you can't wonder i let the boys and girls enjoy themselves can you mais oui i wonder very much cried mademoiselle dismayed at what seemed to her prudent mind such a fatal way of preparing for a difficulty the kind thing surely would be to prepare them for what will come it will make it more hard if they have never known work in three years one can do much to prepare for a struggle why do you not speak to your sister and say it is time to stop play why do you not send her away to work and then perhaps the bad day need never come after all bridgie looked surprised almost shocked at the suggestion the easy-going irish nature saw things in a different light from that taken by the thrifty frenchwoman moreover the idea of girls working for themselves was still viewed as decidedly infra dig by the old-fashioned inhabitants of bolly william she gasped at the thought of her father's wrath at such a suggestion then laughed at the idea of esmeralda's earnings being large enough to stave off the coming ruin i am afraid it would be taking more than that to prevent it therese you don't know the state our landlords are in over here there's no money to be got at all and things go from bad to worse until mother died i didn't know how poor we were and at first i wore myself to pieces saving pennies here and halfpennies there but there's not much fun in saving tuppence when nothing less than thousands of pounds would do any good i grew tired of it and says i to myself a short life and a merry one if i can't help i'll just put the thought from my mind and give the young ones a good time to remember no use troubling the creatures before it's necessary mademoiselle grunted in eloquent disapproval and wished to know whether the master of the house had been equally philosophical is it the major cried bridgie laughing <laughs> he never troubles himself about anything and he has it all fitted up like a puzzle esmeralda is to marry a duke jack a countess in her own right and meself a millionaire manufacturer who will be so flattered at marrying an o'shaughnessy that he will be proud to house pixie into the bargain pat and miles are to go to london to seek their fortunes and the castle is to be let to jack and his wife by preference but failing them to any one who offers when the major can keep himself and his hunters on the rental without a thank you to any one it works out so beautifully when you hear him talk that it seems folly to trouble oneself beforehand and suppose you don't marry your country is full of old maids and suppose the castle does not let it is very far from anywhere said mademoiselle who had lived in the gayest city in the world and felt the solitude of bally william only a degree less absolute than that of the backwoods themselves suppose none of these things of which you speak were to happen what then indeed i can't tell you returned bridgie truthfully enough and excuse me my love it's not a very diverting suggestion for the time of year let me keep my millionaire if it's only for the day for by the same token i'm quite attached to him in prospect <laughs> will you come visit me therese when i'm comfortably established in my soap bubble she was laughing again full of mischief and wilful impracticability and mademoiselle was tactful enough to realize that the time was not apt for pressing her lesson further later on she would return to the charge but to-day at least might be safely given over to enjoyment End of chapter eighteen Chapter nineteen of Pixie O'Shaughnessy by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pat's Taunt When the gong sounded that night, two white robed figures stole out of Mademoiselle's room and crept quietly along the gallery. Pat was arrayed as a knight of old, wearing a pair of Esmeralda's old white stockings, surmounted by loose linen trunks, the rest of the sheet being ingeniously swathed round his body, and kept in place by such an elaborate criss-crossing of tape 
as gave the effect of a slashed doublet a thickly pleated cloak made out of sheet number two hung over his shoulders and the pillow-case was drawn into a cap which was placed jauntily on the side of his head as handsome a young knight as one could wish to see was mr patrick o'shaughnessy and the manner in which he held mademoiselle's hand and led her down the great staircase evoked thunders of applause from the washers beneath mademoiselle herself looked worthy of her squire for her dark animated face stood the test of the unrelieved whiteness so successfully that she was all a blush with delight at the discovery that she was not an old woman after all but on occasion could still look as girlish as she felt she was attired as a normandy peasant with turned back skirt and loose white bodice but the feature of the costume was undoubtedly the cap which looked so extraordinarily like the real article that the sceptical refused to believe in its pillowcase origin until the buttonholes were exhibited in evidence it is wonderful wonderful but how have you made it so stiff and crinkly the major inquired curiously and mademoiselle laughed in gleeful triumph <laughs> i have curled it with the curling tongs not perhaps curl but what the washerwoman would say go faire and for the rest can you not see the wire it is a piece i have taken upstairs after the decorations and it is stitched in to keep the folds in place but i i must keep my head still for it is not too strong you are very fine too sir you are i suppose some old patrician friends romans countrymen lend me your ears declaimed the major throwing his arms about with impassioned gestures his white toga fell in graceful folds round his tall figure his arms were bared to the elbows he wore a twisted turban which was impressive if not exactly appropriate and it was really an imposing spectacle to behold him strutting up and down the hall with a great display of sandaled feet of which he was evidently immensely proud bridgie sat demurely on a high-backed chair a sweet-faced nun with her golden hair hidden from sight and her dark-lashed eyes looking lovelier than ever when contrasted with the white bands across her forehead she had been so busy dressing others that she had had no time to plan anything more elaborate for herself but if she had worked for days she could not have hit on a costume more becoming to her style of beauty it was scarcely in character however to shriek aloud with laughter as she did a moment later as mark antony was suddenly arrested on his march by an apparition which leapt forward from behind a screen and advanced upon him to an accompaniment of unearthly groanings miles as a ghost was certainly an eerie figure for by means of a stick strapped to his back the sheet was raised to an abnormal altitude while a couple of tennis rackets held in either hand made extended wings with which to swoop about and raise warning signals to the onlookers he chased mark antony until that classic gentleman threatened to fight with a poker when he amused himself by groaning vigorously at pixie who had been attired as a lady-in-waiting not it must be confessed with any striking success and who was somewhat ruffled in her temper through constant trippings over her train ye stupid thing she cried crossly be over hooting at me if you are a boogie you can go and haunt by yourself and not molest your betters it's the worst dress of the lot nothing but three sticks and the sheets in knots you had better rest yourself a bit and groan while we are at dinner for your head is covered up that tight you'll never be able to eat trust me cried miles and somewhere about the middle of the ghost the white folds parted and out peered a crimson face with twinkling eyes and a mat of damp curls falling over the forehead you don't catch me taking any part which interfered with eating contrariwise i'm best off of you all for i have just to drop my sticks and there i am the sheet falls down and i eat my dinner in comfort instead of being stewed alive as you will be before it's half over that's true for you i feel as if i had mumps already sighed the nun sadly but the next moment she gave a cry of delight and pointed eagerly across the hall 
esmeralda oh look look there had been so much to see and admire that the absence of the second daughter of the house had not been noticed but even as bridgie spoke each one realized that her late arrival was just what might have been expected the beautiful miss o'shaughnessy had preferred to be sure of her audience before appearing upon the stage for to judge by the continuous rumble of the sewing machine which had sounded from her room she had bestowed no little pains upon her costume great expectations are apt to be disappointed but in this instance it is safe to say that the reality exceeded the wildest dreams for it was almost impossible to believe that this charming figure owed her attire to no more promising materials than ordinary bed linen esmeralda had aimed at nothing less ambitious than a watteau costume and the rumbling of the machine was accounted for by one glance at the elaborately quilted petticoat she had folded a blanket between the double sheet so to as give the effect of wadding and an ancient crinoline held out the folds with old-world effect for the rest she wore the orthodox panniers on the hips and a bodice swathed as artistically as might be round the beautiful bare neck and arms her hair was dressed high and powdered and the pillow-case was drawn into the shape of a hood which dangled lightly over her arm Halfway down the staircase she came to a stand and stood sunning herself in the applause of the beholders, then came slowly forward and, standing in the middle of the floor, revolved slowly round and round so as to display every feature of her costume. It was certainly a marvel of ingenuity, and amidst the general chorus of praise, Mademoiselle could not refrain from improving the occasion by remarking that such a good needlewoman should have no difficulty in turning dressmaker for her own and her sister's benefit the reply to this insinuation was a threatening grimace and esmeralda made haste to draw her father's attention to another topic aren't you proud of me now father dear and cut to the heart to think that no one will see me but yourself sure it's a crime to waste all this splendour on the desert air and she rolled her eyes at him with a languishing glance and smiled so bewitchingly that the major rubbed his hands in delight and fell unhesitatingly into the snare faith and you're right it's a perfect crime we should have asked some of the neighbours to see you bridgie why did you not think of that now we might have had a pleasant little party to amuse your friend instead of taking all this trouble for nothing not on two days invitation father and besides jack is not here yet while he is at home perhaps yes father on new year's eve give us leave to ask some people on new year's eve and we will plan such a wonderful programme as will be the talk for miles around i'm brimful of ideas and we have not had any sort of entertainment for two years now say we may ask them won't you dear but at this the major began to look uneasy for it was one thing to find fault with bridgie for not having given an invitation in the past and quite another to be asked to sanction a fresh one in the future who will you be wanting to ask he inquired anxiously never did i meet such an exacting child my mouth's no sooner open than you are ready to jump inside a wonderful programme says she and who's to pay for it may i ask you would ruin me between you you children if i hadn't saved you the trouble long ago how much will this entertainment be costing me now oh tuppence halfpenny not more than that we will kill the old turkey that is so tough he is fairly pleading to be killed and use up the dessert from christmas and mademoiselle shall make us some of her fine french dishes and there will be so much going on that there will be very little time to eat make your mind easy and trust to me i'll see you through cried esmeralda grandly whereupon the major shrugged his shoulders and reflected cheerfully that a few pounds more or less made little difference let the girl have her way she had been kept too long in seclusion as it was and what was the use of possessing the most beautiful daughter in the county if you could not show her off to your friends once in a while silence was rightly interpreted as consent and having gained her point 
esmeralda was wreathed in smiles and amiability for the rest of the evening the major dispensed with his toga at an early hour and nun and ghost alike shed their wrappings and appeared in ordinary evening dress but esmeralda was too complacently conscious of looking her best to make any change in her attire dinner passed hilariously enough and then the rain having ceased the major put on his coat and went out for a walk in the grounds while the ladies retired to their snuggery upstairs and made themselves comfortable round the fire to them entered presently master pat white knight no longer but an ordinary shabby stripling with pensive eyes and an innocent expression he sat himself down in leisurely fashion and gazed at his second sister with melancholy interest as one far removed from youthful follies and grieved to behold them in those he held dear you are the only one who has kept on her dress i suppose you don't mind what you suffer so long as you make an appearance it's a pity as you said that there is no one to admire you but if you would like to meet a stranger why don't you go for a walk down the left wing and back by the hall the moonlight is shining in at the windows and you know the old saying that if you walk by yourself in the moonlight to-night you will see the spirit of your future husband waiting for you you might have a peep at him now and come back and tell us what he is like esmeralda turned her head on the cushion and looked at him with a lazy smile what nonsense are you talking you are thinking of halloween stupid that has nothing to do with to-day it has then it's just as good as christmas eve we've been told so by those that know but you want to get out of it because you haven't the pluck all girls are afraid of the dark you said yourself it was moonlight i shouldn't be afraid to walk the whole round of the castle if it came to that but i don't see why i should i'm snug and comfortable here and it's not worth disturbing myself to convince a boy like you so you say pat wagged his head in undisguised scepticism it's easy to talk my dear but i should prefer actions to words you made a poor show on that ladder yesterday and i don't like to own a coward for my sister look here now you were worrying me to give you that racket and i said i would do nothing of the kind but i'll change my mind and hand it over to you to-night if you will walk that round and come back here without letting a single howl out of you the whole time bridgie drew her brows together and looked suspicious at this unwanted generosity but esmeralda sprang to her feet all eagerness and excitement you will now honour bright if i walk down the left wing go down the circular staircase and round by the hall you will hand the racket over when i come back i will so you hear that you girls you are witnesses remember i'm off this minute and if i meet my spouse i'll bring him back for a warm by the fire so stoke up and get a good blaze i hope he will think i am becomingly arrayed he was sure to do that was mademoiselle's reflection as she smiled back into the sparkling face and watched the tall figure flit down the corridor quite ghost-like it looked in the cold blue rays which came in through the windows the dead white of the dress standing out sharply against the darkness of the background it was almost as if the spirit of one of those old ancestors whose portraits lined the walls had come back to revisit her old home and bridgie shivered as she looked and turned on pat with unusual sharpness what nonsense are you up to now she'll not catch anything but her death of cold wandering about those galleries with her bare arms and neck spirits indeed you ought to know better than to believe in such nonsense but there's some mischief afoot or you wouldn't be so generous all of a sudden what's the meaning of it now tell me this minute pat's grin of delight extended from ear to ear he stood in obstinate silence until the last flicker of whiteness disappeared in the distance then shut the door and deliberately barred it with his back sit down then and i'll give the history but don't attempt to get out for you'll not pass this door except over my dead body you say she won't meet anybody do you that's where you're wrong for he's waiting for her at this very minute 
he came ringing at the door five minutes ago the young englishman that's with the trelawneys and that father was after offering a mount to the other day is mr o'shaughnessy at home says he he is sir says molly knowing no better for she never had a sight of the major after dinner can i see him for a moment i'll not come farther than the hall for the cart's waiting and i am not fit to enter a room so with that he comes in six foot two if he's an inch and covered from head to foot in a shiny white mackintosh with his head peeping out on top and i've seen uglier men than him before this i was coming down the stairs after shedding me sheets and molly was asking me where the major might be so i told her to send dennis in search and i was all smiles and apologies for the darkness of the place with only the one lamp and the fire dying out on the hearth i'll fetch more light says i and pray do nothing of the kind it's charming to see this fine old place lit up by the moonlight i could study it for an hour on end a perfect setting for a ghost story isn't it says he smiling and with that he crosses over to the window and by the same token it was a regular ghost he looked himself all tall and straight and shiny white then it walked into my head what a jest it would be to send esmeralda to meet him and the two of them each thinking the other was a ghost and frightened out of their seven senses so i excused myself polite like saying i would speak to my sister and the rest of the tale you know for yourselves i taunted her with cowardice to make her rise to the occasion but that wouldn't work and time was passing so i turned to bribery but by good fortune i'll keep my racket yet and at this very moment she will be feeling her way cautiously down that stair and he'll be hearing the creak and coming forward to see the cause all bluey white they'll be and each one so scared by the sight of the other that they'll hardly dare to breathe listen now while i open the door and you may hear her squeal patrick o'shaughnessy you graceless boy how dare you take such a liberty with your sister a strange man an englishman and esmeralda knowing nothing about him and believing there is no one near let me pass now stand aside this moment patrick o'shaughnessy will you let me pass or will you not i will not returned pat sturdily it's my joke and i'm not going to have it spoiled you leave them to fight it out between themselves and if they come out alive you'll hear the tale first hand what do my eyes behold says he what fairy form is this i see before me pity me says she what's that white pillar over there by the window it's a dust sheet that molly has been hanging over the curtains and maybe the draught is making it move oh, oh oh there's a head to it it's alive it comes toward me what will i do what will i do pat clasped his hands in affected terror and shrieked in clever imitation of his sister's manner the door was still ajar and as he stopped a sound from below rose faintly to the ears of his companions a second shriek so alike in tone and expression that it might have been the echo of his own pixie cried bridgie wildly at him pixie at him and like a flash of lightning pixie lay prone on the floor with her arms wound tightly round pat's legs he swayed and staggered clutched at the wall and felt mademoiselle's arms nip him from behind as the door flew open and bridgie sped like a lapwing along the gallery End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain the white lady esmeralda set out on her expedition in the highest spirits for a girl who is brought up on a regime of outdoor sport is not troubled with nerves and she laughed at the suggestion of ghosts with the scorn which it deserved what she did not laugh at however was the promise of pat's racket a gift to him from an absent godfather and coveted by all his brothers and sisters but by none so much as esmeralda who played a very pretty game of her own and felt a conviction that she could distinguish herself still more if she possessed a good racket instead of the old one which had done duty for years and was now badly sprung pat had promised 
in the presence of witnesses to hand over his treasure if she returned to the schoolroom without oh elegant expression letting a howl out of her and esmeralda smiled to herself at the unlikeliness of such a proceeding why except for the cold air it was really a treat to walk along the disused old gallery which traversed the left wing of the castle where the moonbeams shone in through the long row of windows with such picturesque effect she sauntered along enjoying the scene with artistic appreciation even feeling a sense of satisfaction in her own appropriate attire powdered hair and hooped skirt seemed more in keeping with the surroundings than the bicycling dress of everyday life and it was an agreeable variety to pose as one's own great-grandmother once in a way esmeralda reached the end of the gallery and stretched a hand on either side to feel her way down the circular stone staircase which would lead her into the entrance hall below this means of descent was rarely used and was now in a semi-ruinous condition the stone steps being so much worn with the action of time that it required some little care to descend safely in the darkness she stood poised on each step extending a pretty foot to find a secure resting-place on the one below round the curve where the darkness was almost complete then coming into sight of the hall with the moonlight making long streaks of light across the floor and in the distance a yellow gleam from the solitary lamp only three more steps remained to be descended when suddenly she stopped short drawing her breath sharply for there by the second window stood a man's tall form all straight and still and of a curious shining whiteness the face was turned aside but at the sound of that gasping sob it turned slowly round and a pair of keen steel-like eyes stared into hers geoffrey hilliard had been thoroughly enjoying this opportunity of studying the features of the fine old hall and making a note of them for future use what a magnificent old place he said to himself trelawney says the man is at his last gasp and will positively have to turn out before long poor beggar i pity him it must be heartbreaking to leave an old place like this where one's ancestors have lived for generations where every stone has its history and the spirits of the departed seem still hovering in the air hello what's that he turned his head and peering round the corner of that quaintest of stone staircases beheld a vision at sight of which he stood transfixed and astounded spirits of ancestors indeed here was one before his very eyes a picture out of its frame a dream of grace and beauty such as is not vouchsafed to mortal eyes in this commonplace matter-of-fact twentieth century the first glance was admiration alone the second brought a thrill of something uncomfortably like fear for to the most unsuperstitious of minds there was still something unpleasantly eerie in this unexpected apparition motionless as a figure of stone stood the white lady her body craned forward one hand resting against the wall the other drawing aside the quilted skirt the moonlight fell full on the face and showed it stiff and rigid as a sculptor's block for one moment geoffrey felt incapable of movement but the next common sense returned and a dozen matter-of-fact explanations darted into his head what he saw was no figure but simply a statue a reflection a curious effect of light he must examine the phenomenon at close quarters and find a solution with which to confound the superstitious in the future 
no sooner said than done and he stepped forward momentarily averting his eyes to make his sight the more searching when he opened them again the figure still confronted him but now the position seemed slightly altered for instead of bending forward she had drawn back as if to avoid his approach a dread seized him lest the phenomenon might vanish altogether before he had had time to discover its character he gave a sudden leap forward and to his dismay beheld the figure stagger forward and collapse in a heap on the lowest stair in an instant his arms were round her and two warm living hands came together with a shock of surprise masculine ghosts lifted and feminine ghost struggled and pinched in a manner unmistakably human but if geoffrey hilliard's matter-of-fact mind leapt to such a quick understanding of the real situation esmeralda was much more sensational in her explanation he remembered that it was christmas eve a time when some family festivity of which fancy dress was a feature might well be in progress she leapt to the dramatic conclusion that this was a thief masquerading in ghost's attire the better to make his escape in the event of discovery cowardly ruffian he should not find it so easy as he expected if it was only a girl whom he had encountered he should find that she was not so easily shaken off as he expected to hillier's intense amazement he felt the hands fastened suddenly round his arm the white fingers grip his flesh with no uncertain grasp the premeditated apologies died upon his lips as the white lady became rosy red and her lips parted to show teeth set in threatening anger he stepped back or tried to do so but she clung only the closer he laughingly tried to move her hand from his arm at which she shrieked aloud and struggled valiantly no no you shall not go you shall stay here until my father comes that is just what i want to do pardon me there is really no necessity to hold me so fast i am not going to run away returned the young fellow laughing but in a somewhat impatient fashion he had no ambition to be discovered in this melodramatic attitude and once more made an effort to escape the grasp on her wrist was gentle but withal wonderfully strong and to esmeralda's horror she found it impossible to struggle against it the thought that the thief was escaping after all was too humiliating to be borne and as one hand after the other was forced back she grew desperate and raised her voice in a shrill cry for help 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 murder thieves help my dear good girl exclaimed the murderer blankly overcome with amazement and allowing himself to be once more seized in a detaining grasp while esmeralda poured the vials of her wrath upon him how dare you call me names it's a horsewhip you'll be feeling on your back for this once my father is here i'll hold you tight till he comes the stranger looked at her tried to speak choked hopelessly and was just attempting a stammering you are really most complimentary when the sound of flying footsteps came from above and bridgie rushed headlong down the staircase poor bridgie what a sight was that which met her eye in the middle of the hall stood the figure of the tall englishman his face all sparkling with fun his arms hanging slack by his sides while esmeralda clasped him in close embrace reiterating shrilly i'll hold you tight i'll hold you tight for pity's sake esmeralda let go of him this minute she cried rushing to the rescue and laying soothing hands upon her sister's shoulder there's nothing to be frightened at dear it's just that wicked pat 
who ought to be destroyed for his pains it's no ghost darling see now he's laughing at you ghosts don't laugh he's nothing but a man after all he's a thief he was trying to get the things out of the cabinet i'm holding him until father comes so that he may give him in charge gasped esmeralda wildly and hilliard looked from one sister to the other with eyes dancing with amusement i'm neither ghost nor thief as major o'shaughnessy will testify when he arrives i'm really exceedingly sorry to have made such an unfortunate impression but i came on the most innocent errand i'm staying with mr trelawney and your father was kind enough to offer to lend me a mount for to-morrow we thought of going for a long ride in the morning so esmeralda's hands fell to her sides the commonplace explanation did more than a hundred protestations and a remembrance of the major's rhapsodies over the handsome young englishman whom he had met but a week before was still fresh in her mind she stepped back but the light in her eyes gleamed more threateningly than before as with tragic attitude she turned towards the staircase on the lowest step crouched pixie all eyes and gaping mouth on the third mademoiselle clasped her hands and wagged her head from side to side as if calling some one to witness that she at least was innocent of offence from between the banisters peered a red questioning face audacious yet vaguely alarmed patrick o'shaughnessy said esmeralda in an awful voice you shall pay for this evening's work and at that audacity triumphed and pat retorted sharply but not with the racket me dear for ye did howl after all we heard you right up in the schoolroom you are not the hero you thought yourself to mistake an innocent gentleman for a midnight assassin pat be quiet interrupted bridgie sharply then turned to the stranger with that winsome smile which was her greatest charm you've been a schoolboy yourself you know the ways of them my brother never rests out of mischief and he dared my sister joan to walk the round of the castle in the dark she was dressed up as you see and he had seen you down here in your white coat and thought maybe you would each be startled by the sight of the other and at first she wouldn't go at all and was only laughing at him for his pains but pat said christmas eve and halloween were all the same and that if a girl went alone by herself in the moonlight she would see the spirit of her future <laughs> cried pixie in one breathless sentence in her opinion bridgie's explanation had been singularly inadequate and she was filled with indignation at the babble of sounds which drowned her conclusion bridgie was seized with a paroxysm of coughing mademoiselle with admirable promptitude knocked an old metal cup from a bracket and sent it clanging to the floor and pat cried shrilly see a spook she was all dressed in white and you said yourself it was a good setting for a ghost story it was yourself that put it in my head i believe you are right i certainly did make that remark said the stranger obligingly for some reason or other his colour had decidedly heightened during the last few moments and he looked at esmeralda with a quick embarrassed glance as if afraid to meet her eyes she was flushed like himself a beautiful young fury with eyes ablaze and lips set in a hard straight line propitiation was plainly hopeless at the moment and he was not so foolish as to attempt the impossible this was evidently beauty o'shaughnessy of whom he had heard so much and to judge by his own experience his friends accounts of the eccentricities of the family were no whit exaggerated the dear little girl with the sweet eyes was plainly the eldest sister since she took upon herself to perform the honours of the house and he was thankful to follow her towards the fireplace leaving the belligerents at the end of the hall i'm exceedingly sorry to have caused such an alarm 
please make my peace with your sister i am afraid if she was not prepared to see me my actions must have seemed sadly suspicious he began apologetically but bridgie stopped him with uplifted hand and a queenliness of manner which sat charmingly upon her slight figure indeed you were not to blame at all and there is no need to give it another thought you have had bad weather for your visit but i hope there is a change to-night the major will be delighted that you took him at his word and dandy will carry you like a feather here he is at last to welcome you himself the major came forward as she spoke calling out welcomes from afar and holding out his hand in hospitable irish greeting he was all smiles and superlatives charmed that mr hilliard had called overjoyed to give him a mount delighted that he had already made the acquaintance of me children beamingly unconscious that there was trouble in the air and persistent in summoning esmeralda to his side what do you think of that for an impromptu costume all made out of a couple of sheets me dear fellow and at a moment's notice quite a display we had this night with the whole lot of them got up to match but this child is the only one that kept it on me daughter joan esmeralda for short mr geoffrey hilliard hilliard bowed deeply esmeralda drooped her eyelids and the major chuckled afresh at the spirit of the girl a shame to waste such sweetness on the desert air isn't it hilliard that's what she says herself and there's nothing for it but to give my consent to a party on new year's eve a man's not master of himself when he has three daughters but you must give us the pleasure of welcoming you with the rest of our guests the trelawneys will be here to a man and you must come over with them esmeralda says she is fatigued with meeting the same people over and over again so she'll be delighted to see you won't you now esmeralda give your own invitation to mr hilliard indeed father we have scarcely got the length of invitations it was just an idea we were thinking over and at the best it will be a poor country affair if mr hilliard is accustomed to london twould be but a bore to him to join us it was evident that esmeralda was by no means anxious to count the stranger among her guests having shown herself to him in a ridiculous and unbecoming light she had no wish to pursue the acquaintance and the glance which accompanied the words was even more eloquent than themselves don't dare to come here again said the haughty eyes don't imagine you will get the laugh over me said the haughty head and geoffrey hilliard read the signals and smiled unperturbed a happy self-confident smile i assure miss o'shaughnessy that i should be honoured by an invitation he said blandly if i may accept an advance nothing will give me greater pleasure than to join your gathering end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain bridgie's confession after mr hilliard's departure mademoiselle was treated to an exhibition of what was known in the family as esmeralda's tantrums hardly had her father turned from the door than she had rushed towards him and begun pouring out the story of her wrongs eyes flashed head tossed arms waving about in emphatic declamation little foot tapped the floor all a-quiver with excitement while pixie stood in the background faithfully imitating each gesture and pat gazed at the ceiling with an expression of heartbroken innocence esmeralda called upon all present to witness that she was despised and ridiculed by the members of her own family 
that by this evening's work she had been made the laughing-stock of the county and announced her intention of leaving home by the first train that steamed out of the station she would earn her own living and if necessary wander barefoot through the world rather than submit any longer to insults from her own kith and kin and when she died a beggar's death and lay stretched in a pauper's grave they might remember her words and forgive themselves if they could the invective was originally directed against pat alone but as she warmed to her work it grew ever more comprehensive until at last it seemed as though the whole household were in conspiracy against her then suddenly the climax was touched and passed the last stage of all was announced by a tempest of tears and the major tugged miserably at his moustache nerving himself to the task most difficult in the world to his easy-going nature that of finding fault pat ye rascal what's this i hear about you mark my words now i'll not have your sisters made the subject for practical jokes if you can't keep yourself out of mischief i'll find a way to occupy you with something you'd like worse can i have no peace in me own home for the complaints of you and your doings if you can't carry yourself as a gentleman i'll apprentice ye to a trade and wash me hands of you once for all mind what i'm telling you for there's truth in it will i be giving him a punishment now esmeralda is it your wish i should punish him it is so and the harder the better sobbed esmeralda and the major heaved a sigh of ponderous dimensions you hear that patrick listen to that now and see your sister in tears and think shame to yourself on a good christmas eve and now i've the trouble of punishing you into the bargain what will i do with him esmeralda will i send him off to his bed before jack comes home and then a pretty thing happened for among the chorus of groans which greeted this suggestion esmeralda's no no sounded shrillest of all and off she rushed to pat's side in a whirlwind of repentance no no not that he would be so disappointed he must see jack i won't have him punished after all father it's christmas time and he's sorry already tell the major you're sorry pat and i'll shake hands and say no more i'm sorry sir there's been such a stupid row said pat truthfully enough but when his father turned away with a sigh of relief he put his arm round his sister and gave her a bear-like hug what did you howl about silly he asked affectionately when you've had time to cool down you will think of the finest joke of the year and you so well plucked too holding on like grim death for all his struggles you ought to be proud instead of sorry look here now you shall have the racket after all i won't have you the loser for your dealings with me i'll give it to you at once if you'll be troubled to come to my room then esmeralda cried oh pat me darlin and pat hung on to her arms crying hold me tight hold me tight at which she blushed and tugged his curly locks and off they went together laughing squabbling protesting sworn enemies dearest of friends jack arrived in due course and a happier christmas party than that assembled round the breakfast table at knock castle next morning it would have been hard to find each one had provided presents for the others and if they were of infinitesimal value they were apparently none the less valued by the recipients mademoiselle thought she had never seen anything more charming than the manner in which pixie presented and the major received a solitary bone stud for his collar amidst the acclamations of an admiring family a happy christmas to ye father darlin and many happy returns said pixie in deep sweet accents as she pressed the tiny packet into his hand and blinked at it with an air of elaborate indifference it's just a little present i was buying you thinking maybe you would like to wear something i'd chosen meself and now what can this be next soliloquized the major untwisting the paper with tenderest fingers 
and an air of absorption seldom seen on his merry features when wrapping number two was undone and the stud was disclosed in all its glory he appeared almost dizzy with rapture holding it out on an outstretched palm and gazing at it with incredulous joy did ever anything fall out so lucky as that the very thing i was breaking my heart over not an hour ago somebody eats my studs i'm sure they do and what are left esmeralda steals for her cuffs but i'll be even with anybody who dares to take this one from my drawer thank you my piccaninny it's a broth of a stud and you could not have given me anything i liked better i hope it may never break on you when you are in a hurry said pixie politely and with sundry memories of past occasions when the major had dressed for a function while the sound of his groans and lamentations had been heard without the portals of his dressing-room esmeralda presented bridgie with a card of hat-pins bridgie had knitted woollen gloves for the boys and the most exciting presentations were those which mademoiselle had thoughtfully brought with her dainty lace ties for the sisters which were received with a rapture almost too great for words and the grey suede gloves which were jack's happy inspiration dark and threatening as the day appeared on went the gloves and tie when it was time to start for church and esmeralda at least was proudly conscious of her stylish appearance when half way along the muddy lane the trelawney's carriage bowled past and the laughing eyes of the stranger met hers once more the mud flew from the carriage wheels and she held up her skirts with a great display of grey gloved hands and backed up against the hedge frowning and petulant my lady disdain in every gesture and expression mademoiselle had never before attended a christmas service in an english church and though it was impossible to resist some pangs of homesickness she was still interested and impressed the little building was tastefully decorated and the beautiful hymns were sung with delightful heartiness and feeling the o'shaughnessys themselves would have constituted a creditable choir for pat's still unbroken voice was a joy to hear as he joined in the air with bridgie and pixie the major rolled out a sonorous bass jack sang tenor while esmeralda's alto was rich and full as an organ stop they sang with heart as well as voice as indeed who can help singing those wonderful words first the heralds call to christendom to greet the great festival of the year the birthday of its lord christians awake salute the happy morn it must be a cold heart indeed which does not thrill a response to that summons then the description of the angelic joy at his coming hark the herald angels sing and last and perhaps the most beautiful of all the summons to the saints on earth to join in that praise oh come let us adore him christ the lord the service passed in a glow of exultation and the softening influence continued throughout the long walk home when the younger members of the family walked on ahead and the two older girls followed sedately in the rear bridgie's eyes glowed as she looked after her children pat and miles tall and graceful even in this their hobbledy-hoy stage esmeralda queening it in their midst and pixie dancing blissfully through every puddle that came in her way doesn't it make you rejoice to see them all so well and happy she cried fervently last christmas we were so sad that it seemed as if the sun would never shine again but mother said she wanted us to be happy and it would do her heart good to see them to-day i was thinking about her in church and asked myself if i had done all i could to keep my charge she left them in my care you know for i had to take her place and on days like this i feel as if i had to answer to her for all that is wrong pixie is happy at school and it's lovely to know you and feel that you will be good to the darling 
jack is getting on with his work and the boys and esmeralda quarrel less than they used to do she's the one i am most anxious about for she is not satisfied with this quiet life and her head will be turned with flattery before many years are over did you notice that young englishman last night and the way he fixed his eyes upon her if he comes over here flirting with her what will i do therese he is here for a week or two only and after he is gone she will feel duller than ever poor creature i wonder what i had better do miss esmeralda seems to me exceedingly able to take care of herself remarked mademoiselle quietly i don't think you need distress yourself about her in this instance monsieur Illard has had the misfortune to make a bad impression by placing her in an uncomfortable position and have you not observed the air with which she has bowed to him to-day as he passed it was not to say the least of it encouraging bridgie laughed a little tender indulgent laugh <laughs> but it was very pretty all the same and sort of encouraging discouraging don't you think if i were in his place i don't think i should be exactly depressed it was like a challenge thrown down before him and from his look i believe he means to accept it too oh dear it's a great responsibility to have a beauty for a sister i am in terror every time a young man comes to the house in case she should fall in love with her there is more than one girl in the house however and i know which of the two would be my choice if i were as you say a young man myself returned mademoiselle sturdily bridgie's utter unconsciousness of her own claims to attention filled her at once with admiration and impatience and she could not resist putting her feelings into words does it never give you any fear in case one should fall in love with you instead no never how could they when she was near cried bridgie fervently and then suddenly flushed all over her delicate face and began a stammering explanation at least that's not quite true there was one man i never told any one about it before and indeed there's not much to tell joan and i went to stay ten days with some friends at the other side of the county nearly a year ago last autumn and he was staying there too he was not like other men i had met or i thought he was different he was graver than most young men though he liked fun all the same and when we talked it seemed as if we shared the same thoughts it was not long after mother's death and i was feeling very lonely but i didn't feel lonely when i was with him on the third day we went a picnic and i drove in a wagonette with the ladies and he walked with the men just as we overtook them the horses took fright and began to gallop down a hill we thought for a few minutes that we should certainly be thrown out at the bottom but the driver managed to pull up in time and we were none the worse except for the fright the men came racing along to see what had happened and his face was as white as death when he came up he looked straight at me and at no one else though his sister was there and several old friends and he said thank god only that but his voice shook as he said it and he turned away as if he could not bear any more and i felt so strange and glad so happy and proud all that day i felt as if i were walking on air but when i went to bed at night i could not sleep for i realized suddenly what it meant he was growing fond of me and i of him if we were together another week perhaps he would ask me to marry him and go away to the other end of the world for he was a soldier did i tell you that and i had promised mother to look after the children until they were old enough to manage for themselves i couldn't break my word and yet if i stayed on and was nice to him he might think it was wrong of me to say no and i was afraid i couldn't help being nice the sweet voice broke off suddenly and mademoiselle looked into the grey eyes and thought that the young soldier was to be congratulated both on his own good taste and on the feelings which he had been fortunate enough to awaken in this best and sweetest of girls eh bien and what have you done then she inquired eagerly it was a difficult position what have you done oh i did nothing i came away said bridgie 
as simply as if that were not just the most difficult thing she could have done under the circumstances the next morning he went out shooting and the post came in at ten o'clock with a letter from father saying that pat had fallen from the barn and twisted his ankle it was very few weeks he did not fall from the barn as a matter of fact but it was an excuse so i said i must go home and nurse him and they drove me to the station that very afternoon before the men came home mademoiselle drew in her breath in a gasp of amazement she looked at bridgie and her eyes flashed with eloquent comment it was so wonderful to think of the courage with which this young thing with the bright pleasure-loving nature which had come to her as an inheritance had yet had the courage to deliberately put from her the greatest happiness which she could have known in order to devote herself to the care of others the simple unpretentious manner in which the tale was told made so light of the incident that it might have involved little or no suffering but mademoiselle knew better and her voice trembled with sympathy as she put the low-toned question and afterwards did it hurt did it hurt very much shelley i think it did i cried a great deal for several nights when i thought of the good times they were all having together but i knew it would have been worse later on and i comforted myself with that besides what's the use of giving up a thing at all if one can't do it cheerfully it would have been better for me to have married and left home than to stay and make them all miserable by moping and looking sad and they are all such darlings so loving and kind i don't think any other girl ever had such a family as mine the major ignores you the boys worry you to death my lady joan orders you about as if she were a queen and you her servant only the little pixie worships you as you deserve to be worshipped reflected mademoiselle mentally but she kept her reflections to herself and asked another question the answer to which she was longing to hear with truly feminine curiosity and was that all the end of everything what happened next have you not held or seen him since that time the red flew over bridgie's face and she smiled a soft contented smile i've never seen him no only a month after that he was ordered to india and sailed almost at once but he wrote to me before he left a letter arrived one day in a strange handwriting but i guessed almost at once that it was from him he said he had intended to come to ireland in the spring and to call at knock castle but that now it would be impossible for some years to come he said he had enjoyed so much meeting me for those few days and he hoped i should not altogether forget him while he was away would i allow him to write to me now and again and would i send a photograph for a poor exile to take away to comfort his loneliness i had a very nice photograph that a friend of father had taken the summer before and i thought there was no harm in sending him that and writing a polite little note it was very short and i tried not to make it too nice and i said nothing at all about writing only just remarked that it would be interesting to receive letters from india said bridgie with a naivete which made mademoiselle throw up her hand in delight he has written to me four times since then and her eyes began to dance and a dimple danced mischievously in her cheek i enjoy writing to him so much that i answered them the very next day but it would not be proper to send them so soon you know so i put no date but just lock them away in my desk and wait for six weeks or two months before i send them off once i waited for three and then he sent a newspaper there was nothing in it that could interest me in the least but it was just a gentle hurry up i did laugh over that newspaper bridgie bridgie is that this is more serious than i thought no wonder you look upon newcomers with indifference i hope they are very interesting those letters they must be i suppose since you are so eager to reply but at this bridgie shook her head and shrugged her shoulders deprecatingly you are a teacher perhaps you would call them interesting for me they are just a trifle instructive i want to hear about himself and he describes the country and the expeditions they make 
don't please think they are love letters therese they are very very proper not in the least affectionate and my replies are terribly dull you see i'm in an awkward position for everything that would be interesting it would not be proper to say and everything i can say must be uninteresting for he knows almost nothing of us or of our people and yet you are compelled to answer these instructive epistles the moment they arrive and he cannot wait patiently to receive your so dull replies that has only one meaning my dear and it will come when he returns home in a few years and your children are grown up and able to be left it will come i am sure it will come if it is the right thing for me if it is god's will yes it will come and meanwhile i am very happy it is good of him to have given me such a hope in my life said bridgie simply and mademoiselle's eyes dimmed with sudden tears her own nervous restless spirit was for ever kicking against the pricks but she was at least honest enough to acknowledge her shortcomings and the example of this young girl filled her with shame and a humble desire to follow in her footsteps and i am thankful that he has let me know you you do me good cherie i wish to be more like you she said humbly and bridgie opened her grey eyes in bewilderment like me she echoed incredulously my dear the dimple dipped again and she slipped her hand through mademoiselle's arm and shook her in playful remonstrance don't you make fun of your hostess or she'll starve you for your pains the very idea of clever accomplished you wanting to be like blundering irish me End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of pixie o'shaughnessy by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain to see the ruins this begins to grow exciting the plot develops said mademoiselle gaily to herself when the fifth day of the last week in the year was reached and mr geoffrey hilliard made his fifth appearance on the scene in transparently accidental on purpose manner on the first day he had been discovered assiduously pumping up the tires of a bicycle immediately outside the castle gates on the second he was lounging about the village street with an air of boredom which showed that he had exhausted all the objects of interest long before the o'shaughnessy party passed by on their morning walk on the third he paid a formal call in the afternoon and stayed a good two hours by the clock for which breach of etiquette he was so much concerned that he was compelled to come again the next day to apologize and hope the ladies were not fatigued bridgie smiled polite reassurements but esmeralda lay back in her seat and naughtily yawned as though in protest against her sister's words she affected to conceal her weariness but it was a transparent pretence and the young fellow's eyes twinkled with amusement since the moment of their first meeting there had been this pretence of antagonism this playing at fighting on the girl's part but as bridgie had foretold the man seemed to find it rather an encouragement than otherwise and his smile was never more bright and self-confident than after an exhibition like the present miss jones seems to have suffered he said boldly i feel truly guilty but won't you allow me to remedy the mischief if i might make a suggestion it's a perfect winter afternoon and you promised to show me the remains of that old ruin in your grounds don't you think that half an hour's walk before tea would freshen you up i detest ruins they are so dull said esmeralda ungraciously but mr hilliard still continued to smile and to look at her in expectant fashion and presently almost against her will as it seemed she rose from her chair and moved across the room 
of course if you really want to see them it will only take a few minutes come then pixie you were asking me to come out it will do you good to come too bridgie and mademoiselle exchanged a quick glance of amusement at the look of disgust which passed over the visitor's face and which all his politeness was not able to conceal but pixie pranced after her sister with a willing step for it had never entered into her heart to believe it possible that there could exist a living creature unto whom her society could be otherwise than rapturously welcome in the cloak-room off the hall she put on two odd shoes the two which came first to hand and a piebald sealskin jacket which according to tradition had descended from a great-aunt and which was known in the household as the jacket and worn indiscriminately by whosoever might happen to need a warm wrap the effect of this costume finished off by an old bowler hat was so weird and grotesque that at the first moment of beholding it hilliard thought it must surely be a joke designed for his benefit but the air of unconsciousness worn by both girls saved him from making a false move and he speedily forgot all about pixie in admiration of her sister whatever esmeralda wore it seemed as if this were the dress of all others to show off her beauty to the best advantage and the grey golf cape and knitted cap set carelessly over her smoke-like locks appeared at once the ideal garments for a winter promenade pixie slipped her arm underneath the cloak to hang on to her sister's arm and the three set off together across the snow-bound park i suppose you know a great deal about ruins since you were so much interested in ours said esmeralda as an opening to the conversation people are always interested in things they understand that's the only reason why i should like to be clever and learned it would make life so much more satisfying it doesn't amuse me in the least to see old walls and bits of pillars sticking out of the earth i'd pull them all down and build something new in their place if i had the chance but people who understand are quite different some people came here once on a picnic from dublin and father gave them permission to see over the grounds of course it rained but they all stood round on the damp soaking grass while an old gentleman gave a lecture about that miserable little ruin he said something about the shape of the windows and they all took notes and sketches and snapshots as if they had never seen anything so wonderful in their lives there is a bit of pillar two yards high he prosed away about that until i had to yawn but they seemed to like it some of them were quite young too there was a girl rather like bridgie with such a pretty hat esmeralda heaved a sigh of melancholy recollection she stood there and let the rain soak through the ribbons while she sketched the stupid old things i envied her so i thought why can't i be interested in ruins too and then i should have something to think about and to amuse myself with when the time feels so long does the time seem long to you then do you find it dull over here asked hilliard in a tone that was almost tender in its anxious solicitude and esmeralda heaved a sigh of funereal proportions delighted to find herself supplied with a listener ready to sympathize with her woes a home audience is proverbially stoical and after the jeers and smiles of brothers and sisters it was a refreshing change to wake a note of distress at the very beginning of a conversation she became suddenly conscious of a feeling of acute enjoyment but endeavoured to look pensive as befitted the occasion and rolled her grey eyes upward with eloquent sadness oh dull dull does not express my feelings we are so shut in here and so little happens and i know nothing i have had no chance of learning and finding interests in that way why didn't ye study then when ye had the chance ye drove miss minnick crazy with your idleness interposed pixie brutally and esmeralda flushed and hesitated momentarily discomfited then recovering herself cast a melancholy glance in hilliard's face our old governess 
she explained resignedly in the tone of one who might speak volumes but is restrained from feelings of loyalty and decorum a kind old creature so good to us she has lived in this village all her life i understand said the model listener it seemed to him quite natural that this beautiful creature possessed an intellect to match her person and felt her eagle wings pinioned in the atmosphere of an irish village he wished he were only more intellectual himself so that he might be a fitter companion and devoutly hoped that he might make no bad slip to betray his ignorance and so alienate her sweet confidence as you say the more one knows the less possible it should be to be dull or idle amusement can never make up for good solid occupation oh never never cried miss esmeralda with a fervour which brought pixie's eyes upon her in a flash of righteous indignation esmeralda to talk like this esmeralda who sat at ease while others worked who groaned aloud if asked to sew on a button and was at once so dilatory and so inefficient that bridgie declared it was easier to do a task at once than to unravel it after her vain attempts pixie gasped and pranced on ahead her back towards the direction in which she was going her face turned upon the culprit in kindling reproach joan o'shaughnessy what's happened to you to talk in such a fashion this day you that doesn't know the meaning of work to be sighing and groaning that you haven't enough to do you to be saying that it would cheer you to be busy when ye sigh like a furnace and grumble the day long if you have to work for an hour on end i've heard ye say with my own ears that if you had your own way you would never do another hand's turn and of all the lazy idle girls wouldn't it perhaps be wise if you looked which way you were going the ground is rough and i am afraid you will have a fall interposed hilliard mildly not that he was in truth the least bit anxious about this strange child's safety or could not have witnessed her downfall with equanimity but in pity for esmeralda's embarrassment she could not be allowed to continue her tirade indefinitely he was rewarded by a melting glance as the beauty sighed once more and said in a tone of sweet forbearance she does not understand she has been away and that's not the sort of work i meant and besides she stopped short for she could not think how to finish the sentence and the fear of pixie was ever before her eyes it was in a different and much more natural voice that she again took up her explanation perhaps i was mistaken in saying it was work i wanted but it is certainly interest i have never been farther away than dublin and i get so tired and weary of it all and have such a longing for something fresh the others don't feel it for they are so fond of the place but i'm restless i feel pent in knowing the world is moving on and on all the time and i am shut up here and sometimes the longing comes over me so strongly that it's more than i can bear and i fall into a rage said pixie calmly esmeralda had paused just long enough to draw that short eloquent breath which adds so largely to the eloquence of a peroration and was preparing to roll out a tragic despair when that tiresome child must needs interfere and spoil everything by her suggestion esmeralda's anger was quickly roused but fortunately even quicker still was her sense of humour for a moment clouds and sunshine struggled together upon her face then the sunshine prevailed she looked at hilliard beheld him biting his lips in a vain effort to preserve composure and went off into peal after peal of rich melodious laughter <laughs> next time i wish to talk at my ease it's not bringing you out with me i'll be pixie o'shaughnessy she cried between her gasps 
and hilliard's merry ho 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 rang out in echo she is indeed a most painfully honest accompanist i am thankful that i have no small brothers to give me away in return you give your sister a very bad character miss pixie but you seem very little in awe of her i notice she must possess some redeeming qualities to make up for the bad ones you have quoted pixie bent her head in benignant assent as one bound by honesty to see both sides of a question and to deal out praise with blame she's idle she said judicially and she's hasty but she's sorry afterwards the more awful her temper the quicker she's sorry the night after you left thank you pixie you can spare us further domestic revelations cried esmeralda flushing in lovely confusion and keeping her face turned away from the merry blue eyes so persistently bent upon her there's one comfort mr hilliard you know the worst of me now and there is nothing more to dread pixie has spoiled my chance of posing as a blighted genius and shown me as just a bad-tempered discontented girl who has not the sense to be satisfied with her position i'm sorry for it would have been interesting to hear you talk like the clever intellectual people in books and perhaps if i had kept very quiet and agreed with all you said you wouldn't have discovered my ignorance for quite a long time to come but dear me you would have discovered mine i couldn't have kept it up for an hour you surely don't expect me to lecture on improving topics cried hilliard in such transparent amaze that esmeralda could not but be convinced of his sincerity then you are not clever either she exclaimed what a relief now we can just talk comfortably and not pretend any more but at any rate you've seen more than we have have you travelled much what have you seen what countries have you been in i can hardly say straight off let me count france belgium switzerland germany italy greece turkey the o's and ah's of astonishment had been steadily gaining in volume but at the sound of this last name they reached a perfect shriek of delight there was something so very strange and mysterious about turkey that even to see a man who had visited its borders gave one a thrill of excitement pixie's premeditated boast that she had been in surbiton died upon her lips and esmeralda's eyes grew soft with wonder turkey oh you are a traveller what on earth made you go to turkey it was part of a tour on which my uncle took me after leaving the university and i went even farther afield than that to palestine and egypt you would like egypt even better than turkey miss joan for there thanks to our rule you have picturesqueness without squalor whereas turkey does not stand a close inspection we were thankful to leave constantinople after a very few days but were sad indeed to turn our backs on fascinating cairo if i had the seven-leagued boots i should be a frequent visitor over there the two sisters linked arms and gazed at him with awe-stricken eyes and you have seen veiled women sighed esmeralda softly and mont blanc and the pyramids and the desert and the red sea and st peter's at rome and all the things i have dreamt of ever since i was a child oh you are lucky i think i should die with joy if any one offered to take me on a trip like that did you have any adventures what did you like best begin at the beginning and tell us all about it well as our american cousins would say this was rather a large order but hilliard could refuse nothing to such an audience and if the truth must be told had his full share of the traveller's love of relating his experiences he passed lightly over days spent in countries near home but grew even more and more animated as he went farther afield and reached the eastern surroundings in which he delighted shall i tell you about palestine i never knew anything stranger 
than arriving at that railway station and seeing jerusalem written up on the hoardings it seemed extraordinary to have a station there at all and such a station it was in autumn and everything was white with dust outside in the road were a number of the most extraordinary looking vehicles you can possibly imagine white as if they had been kept in a flour mill and as decrepit as if a hundred years had passed since they were last used how they kept together at all was a marvel to me and as for the harness there was more string than leather to be seen the drive from the station to the hotel was one of the most exciting things i have ever experienced i am not nervous and have had as much driving as most fellows but that was a bit too much even for me the road is very hilly turns sharply at many corners and is of course badly made to the last degree so that it would have seemed difficult enough to manage such crazy vehicles even at a foot-pace but our fellow drove as if the furies were at his back as if it were a question of life and death to get to the hotel before any of his companions he stood up on the box and shouted to his horses he lashed at them with his whip he yelled imprecations to the rivals who were galloping in pursuit when an especially dangerous corner came into view two drivers made for it in a reckless stampede which made it seem certain that one or the other must be hurled to the bottom of the hill a lady inside our carriage burst into a flood of tears and i believe her companions were all clinging to one another in terror as for me i was on the box and i never passed a more exciting ten minutes we were told afterward that we had had the best driver in jerusalem but i never engaged his services again that same night in the hotel i was introduced to a dragoman whom we engaged to take us about i am sure you will like to hear about selim for apart from himself he had a great claim to attention for he had been in gordon's dragoman years ago when he was in egypt yes i knew that would interest you and you would have loved selim for his own sake too he had a gentle sad face with the beautiful dark eyes of the eastern and he spoke english remarkably well he was unmarried and lived with his mother and a married brother sixteen years he and his sister-in-law had lived in the same house but he had never seen her face he had been unlucky in money matters but accepted his poverty with the placid acquiescence of the oriental i remember one day when he told me of a piece of good fortune which had befallen a fellow dragoman and i said that i hoped he might be similarly fortunate he bowed his head with quiet dignity and waved a brown hand in the air that is with god sahib that is with god i used to question him about gordon and he loved to talk of him he was a good man sahib better than any bishop when we were camping in the desert he was up every morning before it was light kneeling to pray before his tent and his heart was so great that he could not bear to see any one in trouble i must always keep with me a bag with small monies and he would not wait to be asked every one who needed must be helped when he went away he gave me his two best horses but my heart was sore he was a great chief a great chief but i heard afterwards that when he came to die he was quite poor the same as christ hilliard told a story well and now as he repeated the words his voice softened into the deep cadence of the eastern tones in which they had first been said his hand waved and his eye kindled with emotion esmeralda looked at him and her heart gave a throb of admiration the manner in which he had spoken was unmistakably reverent and if young men only knew it there is nothing which a girl loves more than a mingling of manliness and reverence in the man who singles her out for attention he is a good man i like him was the mental comment aloud she said dreamily gordon is my hero i love to hear about him he was too generous to others to heap up money for himself i suppose he didn't care about it i wish i didn't but i do 
it's so very distressing to be always short of money all the good people in books are poor but for myself i think it's bad for the temper they talk about the peril of riches but i should like to try it for myself wouldn't you mr hilliard hilliard smiled a quiet amused smile well i don't know everything is comparative if some people would think us poor others would most certainly consider us very rich indeed we have all that we need and for myself i'm quite content i manage to have a very good time and you get away for holidays like this that must make it easier have you to work very hard what is your work in what way do you make your living once more hilliard smiled in amusement and in truth there was a directness about esmeralda's questionings which was as unusual as it was unconscious he put up his hand and stroked one end of his curly moustache glue glue echoed esmeralda shrilly glue shrieked pixie in even shriller echo the two pairs of eyes were fixed upon him in horrified incredulity the pity the commiseration of their expressions was touching to behold oh poor fellow sighed esmeralda softly you must be poor how can any one manage to make a living out of glue but you know esmeralda darling it is useful we break such heaps of things ourselves we often use it urged pixie anxiously and at this her sister brightened visibly we do that's true for you pixie perhaps it's your glue we use mr hilliard dear me it will be quite cheering when we break anything after this we shall feel we are helping a friend by our misfortune that's very kind of you i'll remember that you said that and it will cheer me too replied hilliard gallantly and at that very moment a sound came to the ears of all the gong it must be tea-time they are sounding it to let us hear i hope i have not kept you out too long ten minutes later they were all seated in the hall enjoying tea and scones while bridgie smiled sweetly on their flushed animated faces you look well after your walk she said and what did mr hilliard think of our tame ruins pixie looked at esmeralda esmeralda looked at mr hilliard mr hilliard looked at his boots one and all they had forgotten all about the ruins end of chapter twenty two